All right, we're good. Right, so uh, I wanted to uh, go through this uh, paper from 2018 with you guys since it uh, has some relevance to what I'm doing, but reading through it, I realized it's not as interesting as it seemed, <laughs> or at least, you know, that's my takeaway. Um, and, but what I really wanted to do, and the reason I postponed it from last week is uh, I was getting into the literature of uh, using dendrites or, or things that you know, are inspired by dendrites uh, in the machine learning literature. And I wanted to like wrap my head around that um, and, and see like what the, you know, what the potential is in different directions. So briefly, the, uh, the idea uh, of using dendrites in machine learning, the earliest uh, reference I could find uh, that was also cited by a lot of the, the subsequent papers was by this paper by uh, Panayota Poirazi and uh, Mel. Uh, and what they did is basically, as this little hand shows you, is that they could uh, approximate the firing rate of a pyramidal CA1 neuron uh, by modeling it as a two-layer neural network with a sigmoidal output. Uh, it was a sigmoidal activation function. So that was like their best fit model, basically. Uh, and they're like, oh, look, so basically the neuron is complex enough that the, that each little, each dendritic segment is like a little neuron, basically, a little artificial neuron. Um, and I didn't show the HTM neuron here because it's, it has like little binary things and I thought that would confuse people. Um, and, but basically what people have been looking at since is this sort of separation uh, between like apical and uh, so, and they don't call it basal usually, but may, mainly like a feed forward uh, dendrites that uh, strongly influences soma. So, oh yeah, sorry. So this is like their best fit uh, in that in that paper. They basically find that like the sigmoid they they derived a sigmoid that had like the best fit to the uh, to the real data, and you know it wasn't linear, which also. Uh, also means that you know there's a, like a nonlinearity happening in the in the dendrites. What what was the real data that we're using here? So they used the uh, patch patch recording patch clamp recordings from uh, CA1 neurons, and I think they stimulated uh, just various different uh, dendrites. Oh. I mean, because in general, when you get well, this may be they may not be thinking about dendritic spikes, but generally, you can't get the cell to fire from activating you know a section of a den distal dendrite. Yeah, I think this was, uh, if I remember correctly, this was from a model neuron, not actual recordings. Okay. Is that true? Sorry, you might be right. Well, I mean, there's, there's a lot of literature which shows that when you activate um, distal dendrites, even in combination with regenerated dendritic spikes, that uh, it, the cell doesn't fire. <laughs> that's that's uh, one of the key things. No, no, we, we, we know that. Sorry if, uh, if I said that it was by accident. I think they, no, they, no, were, it's, they were getting the firing rate. So. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not even firing rate, I guess it's, uh, okay, so anyway, these are, they were trying to show how the, these uh, distal dendrites would affect firing rate, not fire. I mean, uh, because cause that little picture there showing the, the sum of, uh, this, you know, the sum of these um, you know, two-layer neural network would imply that, um, I guess you're saying you have to have a certain yeah. amount of No, but yeah. this wasn't yeah. focused on the apical dendrites. This was focused and on- even on the even on the non-apical one. Yeah, even on the non-apical. I mean, that was the whole premise behind the HTM sequence theory, yeah. sequence uh, yeah. memory. So all of this was done on mo uh, on models, not actual recordings. They were actually, yeah. Bartlett Mel actually had a paper earlier than this, and then Iota and Bartlett published this. Um, and these were this modeling work was really what led to the experimental literature, experimental work that came after them. So these guys actually predicted some of this beforehand, mm -hmm. but this is all completely modeling work, as I remember. Yeah. No, you're right. Okay. This is from a neuron model. You're uh, absolutely right. I don't know why. Because yeah, okay. a real neuron, you would not be able to do that as Jeff. Well, that's said. what I was thinking. I was thinking a real neuron wouldn't produce this chart. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so I was like, well, right. how did that happen? Okay, that's all right. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, just to be clear. Okay. Yeah, I mean, these are things we've discussed a lot over the last 10 years. Um, awesome. I'm sorry, I'm a little slow then. What are the two axes? How is there a predicted and an actual? Are both axes models in some way? Or? So the actual is the, of, the, of the actual neuron model and the predicted is from the two layer neural network. So the neuron model is a biophysical model. I see. Um, Eris, uh, I have a question on the model. How do you combine the, so each alpha is a dendritic branch, right? And how do you combine them to form the Y? Is it like a, a max out? You only need one of them to fire to 
far away or no no this is like a simple like this is a perceptron with a sigmoid activation so it's a sum it's a weighted sum right right that but yeah that's this is this is equivalent to a two-layer network uh there's no max out or anything like that here yeah, there's, no, there's a very simple two-layer model but this is how you combine the ends with a weighted sum but then how do you combine the alphas that's not very clear there that's the same thing isn't it it's just uh because it's the alpha so it's only, is the activation of the output neuron. This is like the model neuron, the soma. Uh, oh, but that—that's not the soma, is it? Oh, okay. So yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll the edge there. The alpha are the weights oh, into, you mean that, into that. that output. Yeah, alpha is the overall weight into the output neuron. Oh, okay. All right, okay. All right. Which okay. is, as far as I know, I don't know if there's any. That just was made up. I mean, I don't know if there is anything such as that. If there's any what? Uh, any, mm -hmm. Anything such as a weight of a dendrite branch. Uh, uh, well, yeah, yeah, maybe the coupling between the dendrite and the soma. Like, yeah, so, I mean, there's, it's a okay. complex system, but I don't, the idea that it might be a learned weight, I've never seen anything about that. Well, yeah, I know, but I, you know, the, in these models, you, you learn like these... Um, I, I understand. I'm just pointing out the difference between these models, which are sort of coming in, assuming that you're having a two-layer, that there's a two-layer neural network, and the biology of a, of, of a real neuron, I'm just pointing out there's a, there's a lot of discrepancies between them. Oh, they're drastically different. Yeah, this yeah is, I, I'm just yeah. pointing out this. We were just talking, Lucas was just asking about those alphas, and they show them as little dots as bigger and smaller, assuming there's some, some sort of learned weight there. Um, I'm just pointing out then in a real like pyramidal cell, I don't think there's any ever, well, I wouldn't say there's no evidence because there's somebody, there's some place that said something, but in general, the, um, that's not considered, uh, there, there isn't a, strong evidence that there's like a learned weight of a dendritic branch like that. Those alphas are sort of a made up thing. Yeah. So, right, so uh, yeah, the idea is, sorry, let me move this Zoom screen over a second. Right, so uh, in a previous paper with Pordazi and Mel, they uh, found that basically nonlinear, having nonlinear subunits, uh, sorry, as, uh, you know, uh, as uh, dendritic segments in their in their models also led to much higher storage capacity. Um, so basically, inspired from this, I presume, because uh, they, they cited a lot, um, a number of papers have recently looked at uh, at using these separate uh, segments to uh, to leverage them in their models. So um, this is from a review by uh, DeepMind. Uh, is they, they really like the idea that there's feedback projections going to apical dendrites uh, and feed forward uh, projections going to uh, basal dendrites. And this is all consistent with all the literature and also the, the HTM model uh, uses this. Uh, and then what they uh, want to do is, uh, and this is about the, uh, the models that look at this, uh, the apical feedback, um, sorry, at the apical activity, uh, what they focus on is this plateau potential. So when you have uh, the, the green little uh, thing here is the uh, dendritic, the apical dendrite voltage. So if you have like a spike coming in with feed forward activation, uh, you'll get like an attenuated voltage increase in the calcium active zone basically over here as you go to the apical side. Uh, but if you have the feedback uh, and the feed forward uh, combination, basically if you have uh, activation of the apical dendrites, you have this plateau. And this plateau might have really interesting properties. I mean, it does have really interesting properties. Um, so what uh, the uh, Georgiev and Lillikrap pro uh, propose is that they have, um, is that this could lead to like a much cleaner uh, and much nicer way of uh, separating your error uh, in, in these um, more biologically plausible neural network models. So they compare this with uh, previous, oops, excuse me, uh, with, previous, uh, with previous models where you'd have, you know, uh, backpropagated, you'd have feedback connections going to, uh, you know, output neurons, uh, to hidden layer neurons, and you'd have like an error pathway that uh, separately uh, activated them. And this adds model complexity because you're adding a lot more parameters to the model. And what, uh, I mean, this also adds a lot of parameters to the model, but they don't think this is biologically plausible, but they think this is. Um, and they think that basically having uh, feedback projections from, let's say, your output uh, layer, th those can go into the apical uh, dendrite side. Uh, and, sorry, into the apical dendrite side, and then uh, trigger, you know, 
the learning might happen and the interplay here uh, in between the apical dendrite, which is a little delta thing, and the, and the soma. And this way they want to propose a, a type of like local learning rule. Where is it, is this, I want to make sure I understand this drawing here. So in this drawing, they're showing a two, two circle, gray circles. That's like the apical integration zone in the, in the somatic integration zone. Is mm -hmm. that what the, so so it's, it, it, all these things are really tightly here in the, so they're saying the feedback goes, the great black feedback goes just to the apical one. I, yeah. I just took me a while to realize that that's what's going on. It's, it's not two layers of neurons. It's a, they're showing two dots per neuron, basically, yeah, in the gray, the gray dots. Right, so they're, they, have, they have like two separate pathways. They have a feed forward and a feedback pathway, as you said, and the feedback pathway goes onto the uh, apical component. Um, and they think this is more biologically plausible than uh, one of the other solutions, which is this having a separate error pathway or having feedback uh, weights that are symmetrical to the feed forward weights. I mean, but um, the, upper drawing, the upper drawing doesn't show any neurons of apical dendrite. So it's, I just was confused by that. So. Yeah, yeah, sorry if uh, I, I didn't explain that well. So this is their proposed solution, but they think that apical dendrites can be le okay. leveraged for this. This is a, a schematic of some other models that had been uh, created. Okay, some other models that had nothing to do with uh, multi-compartment dendrite uh, no, no, no. neurons. And they're saying- they basically, mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, the, so they basically propose the, the apical dendrite as a way to integrate feed forward and feedback information. So the, the rationale starts with how do you integrate feedback information to create like a local learning rule and their solution is you create an apical dendrite layer and uh, an apical dendrite segment. Uh, so there's uh, other uh, work by uh, Walter Zen uh, and others uh, has uh, has uh, you know also leveraged the the idea of uh, apical dendrites, uh, and they use like a form of predictive coding, where basically the um, it was always the, the, every diagram I found of that model was a little bit complex. So <laughs> sorry, this is the simplest one I found, and it's still not super uh, not super obvious. But basically, what they do is they have there's a feed forward input that comes into the soma, and you can ignore. Assume this comes into the basal dendrites, so you can ignore this like schematic thing. But in the neuron model, obviously, it would just be like a feed forward summation. Uh, um, and this dendrite segment basically gets uh, information about the target. This, so the target here is like what, um, it, it's like a projection, uh, it's a projection from, you know, what, what you want to reach, right? Let's say you want to, uh, you're doing MNIST and you want to, uh, you want the output to be for the, for the digit number nine. So information about the digit number nine that's been filtered in a way such that the output layer is clamped to it or you know, some other manipulation comes into this distal dendrite component. And basically they have this really clever thing where uh, the soma, uh, they, they find like a reversal potential uh, for uh, the somatic voltage, uh, which is so basic, which is, um, which is basically you no know, zero zero voltage, right? The reversal potential is um, uh, so basically the uh, the feed forward uh, the feed forward weights basically nudge uh, nudge the nudge the soma towards uh, the feed uh, towards this uh, uh, towards this reversal potential, and then in the absence of any imagine like you uh, occlude the dendrite now for now in the absence of any dendritic uh, stuff happening. The, uh, the, this was all the soma would do. It would try to like uh, go to this uh, reversal potential. But the dendrite uh, has with, it, with its plateau and they assume like a tight, uh, a strong coupling between the dendrite and the soma. Uh, the dendrite has uh, you know, the information about the target and basically uh, for the soma to now go towards this, um, for the soma to go towards the uh, reversal potential, which is like a zero activation, uh, it needs to uh, it needs to update its weights such that they would do that effectively. So what this is is a form of predictive coding, really, where they compare, you know, they subtract the uh, dendritic from the somatic potential, or vice versa. I mean, it doesn't matter if you square it, um, and they use that as a sort of little dynamical system that uh, nudges the soma towards uh, a state towards zero. Basically, they want like the the, the soma to create basically zero output. Uh, and that's where this inheritory circuit element comes in. So a, oh, okay, before you go on, I have a question at the end of this one. Mm -hmm. but you can keep coming and I'll just ask when you're done. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, um, I, I have a basic question, and maybe it's just a more of a neural network question and not really specific to this thing. Is I'm trying to understand how the target signal is represented. You have a, mm -hmm. you have a layer of neurons. You have some output representation you want, but there's a lot of large connectivity between the layer of neurons and the output representation. And you got this, you know, feedback. How how is that? I mean, how? I mean, don't we? We want to differentially modify each of those neurons in the in the hidden layer. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, how is it? How does how does that differentiation occur? I mean, how does the target? How is the target dif the, in, uh, differentially? affecting different neurons in the hidden layer. Right? It's a basic question I don't understand about neural networks. I understand it in brains, but I don't stand here. Like that green arrow, how does the green arrow differ between each of the hidden units? Or does uh, it, or what does it look like? What's that signal look like, that green arrow? Right, so this is the other diagram I wanted to show you where it was more complicated. Uh, so basically it's just a direct projection and I think they manipulate it such that, uh, so this is, the, this is the target input, right? Um, hang on, is this the right diagram? Or is that the target output? No, I think that was, uh, that was feedback from the target. Yeah, so it's like what you're, what you're hoping for, right? It's the, the number Yeah, line. exactly. So if I understand correctly, or if I remember correctly, this, uh, so the target here is clamped to your desired value, for example, or it's updated by the error somehow between like, you know, its output and the desired output. And this basically projects to, so th th it just happens by the fact that the weights are, are different, I guess. Uh, and uh, so it's assuming a sort of a random initial weight from the feedback projection. Is that, I mean, I'm wondering how do you break the symmetry, right? You got this, you mm -hmm. got this desired output and you got a bunch of, it's in every neuron in your hidden layer is connected to the output. Mm -hmm. How is it, how is it differentiated? And is it just by random differences in the connection weights and then they over time um, separate? Is that? Well, yes, and also uh, recall that the, the sense, the feed forward component is also different uh, for each neuron. So there's different sensory inputs. Yeah, but also I'm, just by wondering, I'm just wondering how the, I'm just trying to understand what the representation of that feedback looks like. You know, okay, I got this neuron and what is it? Is this some scalar value that's being imposed upon the apical dendrite? I, yeah, I yeah, it's a scalar, yeah. sorry, yeah, it's, it's a scalar value that goes to the dendrite. And, uh, and, then, and then there's an assume that the, each apical dendrite has its there's a weight associated with that. So how that affects each neuron is different. Is that right? Sorry, can you repeat the last part? I'm just trying to understand if, I, if I'm a neuron in the hidden layer and I'm getting mm -hmm. this feedback on my, now on my apical dendrite, right? Um, is it just a scalar value I'm getting and every neuron's getting that same scale, every neuron in the hidden unit layer is getting the same scalar value? So I, think the, it, mm -hmm. I think the idea then, is every, each one of these neurons is getting like a different scalar value because well, of the weight. Well, Oh, because of the weight, yes, but the right. actual, the blue arrow in this diagram or the blue thing from the mm -hmm. uh, thing called new association, that would yeah. be the same for every neuron and then there's a weight at the end of that so each neuron would differentiate uh, based yeah. on that weight. Is that right? Exactly, yeah. Okay. And they also get different sensory inputs. So some neuron, uh, some fraction of the neurons will be able to converge towards like minimizing this error with this learning algorithm. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know what they do because I've only read it, uh, their implementation of like how to do this learning locally in one neuron. I, uh, I don't know what they do if they make like a big network out of this. Uh, maybe some of you have like read deeper into this. Um, no, it just helped me out. I, I, I just had the basic mis lack of knowledge about neural. Oh yeah, no, the, sure, sure, yeah. Now uh, know. I mean, we, we, would, we would assume that, we would know in a brain that these are sparse distributed representations and therefore the, the, that's how they differentiate very easily. Mm -hmm. uh, here it's basically just that the the weight of that um, each each hidden unit has a weight associated with the feedback, but they're all getting the same number. Okay, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. So there's like a number here, and yeah, got yeah, it. Yeah. All right. Sorry for the, yeah. sorry for the. No, that's fine. Uh, and no, I understand this this diagram is rather like complicated. Um, so what they find is that basically this learning rule, where the neuron tries to like uh, minimize this prediction error, is equivalent to backpropagation. Um, Uh, so that this is equivalent to backpropagation, so that you can actually differentiate this, uh, you know, using this learning objective, you can differentiate it easily and uh, leverage the, the strengths of backpropagation um, uh, and credit assignment. Uh, and so this has been like pretty interesting uh, work. And then some of uh, the work that um, Georgiev and Lilikar proposed, which I think is later, I think this is 2017, yeah, 2017. 
they basically, uh, they, they created this little diagram on the left with uh, this feed forward and feedback separation. And the reason they wanted to do that was because they wanted to uh, solve credit assignment in biologically plausible neural networks. So credit assignment is the idea that like, okay, you know, this given that uh, there's an error in the desired output, you know, or something like, I wanna, I wanna reach a desired output and I wanna learn, uh, where do I put blame on which synaptic weights and on which neurons do I put blame for being like, hey, your contribution is the one that's like throwing us off. So adjust by X amount. Uh, so Hebbian rules, uh, at least two factor Hebbian rules that are just pre and post synaptic, they, they do not do credit assignment. Um, even though they do produce like very interesting, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, you know, very interesting receptive fields that look like um, receptive fields in the cortex frequently. Uh, though in my opinion, like basically any nonlinear uh, optimization will, will create receptive fields that look like receptive fields in the cortex. Um, they, uh, they, they, they don't provide credit assignment, these Hebbian rules. So they're like, how do we do credit assignment? So let's leverage this uh, dendritic, you know, this apical dendrite component and look at the plateaus. So they have these... Um, they're, they're, they actually use like a spiking real-time uh, model. Uh, and I mean, the plateaus don't spike, the, sorry, the apical dendrites don't spike in their model. Um, but basically they create these plateaus, right? So this is like, you know, at some, at some time, uh, at some time T, you know, the, the, pl the potential in the, um, the potential in the, in the apical dendrite evolves. And then they average this uh, and, in, the, in each phase of the training. So there's two phases in training here. Sorry, I could have ordered this in a much clearer way. So basically they have two phases in training. One is like this feed forward component, which is basically they put the uh, data, let's say the image, the MNIST image, uh, they feed it through the network. And uh, this leads to a calcium plateau, right? And then they have the bit where the feed forward, so there's still feed forward input, uh, but the, uh, they also include the feedback input. And this leads to a different calcium plateau. And the feedback, basically what the feedback does is it tells, it creates the instruction signal. It creates the instruction plateau signal. It's like, this is a plateau you should have uh, if, uh, if you were perfectly representing, uh, you know, if you, were, uh, if, you're, if you were like perfectly contributing to uh, minimizing the error on this task. And basically because of their setup, they can differentiate this difference between the target plateau uh, and the, plat the feed forward plateau. And so they update the weights uh, using backprop uh, to, uh, to, to match this. Is, uh, is everyone like clear on this? I think that's what they do. Um, cool, and then like the plateau potential, uh, since, they're, um, since they're summing it, uh, since they're averaging it, they uh, derive like a, a sigmoidal function of it so that, uh, that that's what they use to differentiate. So these are like some interesting ideas of uh, how to uh, include uh, apical dendrites uh, in, in machine learning. And then, uh, and this leads us to the, the paper that uh, I wanted to review, which- uh, It's just, just a question, of, uh, just yeah. a question about that. Um, so are, are, these, uh, are these ideas, have they been implemented in machine learning networks and people, have they done benchmarking on them or is it just more of this sort of like theoretical work? Uh, they have they have implemented them. Uh, I think they, they they each have like different um, different weaknesses and different strengths. Uh, and from what I've seen, the they're doing follow up work on this, but it's not like uh, it's not I mean, like. Mm -hmm. is, I mean, have these uh, do the, do this models improve upon performance in any way? Or I mean, I'm just trying. To, this is conceptual ideas. And I'm just curious if they beyond, move beyond the concept phase into sort of like we tested them and they're more robust or they're better accuracy or neither or, you know. Right. I mean, I don't think current neural networks are using these ideas, right? Um, uh, no, I think the, the motivation between both of these approaches is to make them more biological and as such, they haven't like super optimized the, um, the parameter space. So uh, they compare, if I understand correctly, they, they compare favorably with, you know, whatever state of the art was at the time. Oh, uh, so they have they have implemented them then. So, oh yeah, they have implemented them, but yeah. they don't uh, have like a, oh this this architecture leads us to like much higher robustness to uh -huh. noise or you know uh, th this or that. Um, I mean, there's two um, basic well, maybe approaches. maybe as a maybe as a back. Uh, I think just to be clear, these have not been tried 
in machine learning. The goal for these is to basically they start by saying backprop is the best you can do. And the goal here is to see, okay, do biological networks. Does the neocortex implement some form of backpropagation? Yeah, so, so the, I, I was about to say. Yeah, yeah, the idea behind here is to make uh, biologically plausible models of backpropagation. So I think they're you know, not it, trying to improve machine learning in any way. It's kind of a contrast to what we're trying to do. Where yeah, I it's the opposite saying, of what we're trying. They're, to do. Yeah, they're saying, hey, we've got these machine learning models. Can we justify them by saying brains work this way? Therefore, we don't think about brains more. Um, and uh, or our approach is like, no, or, or maybe, works. yeah, or maybe they're you know they're trying to understand how the brain. This is a way for them to try to understand how the brain might do more complex learning, like uh -huh. backpropagation does. Yeah, and and backpropagation yeah. solves this credit assignment problem with deep with hidden layers. Mm. And they're saying, well, the brain has to solve the same problem. Yeah. How could it possibly do that? Because pure heavy learning won't do it. So yeah. these kind of structures they show yeah. that it basically approximates what backpropagation will do. Yeah. Um, okay. So, and our approach is sort of to flip it around to saying, hey, given a model of what the brain is doing, can we improve uh, exactly. yeah. deep learning machine methods? Learning. Yeah, yeah, machine learning yeah. methods. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. There are very few people doing that direction. I, I, I thought so, but I didn't know yeah. enough about, I didn't know about these people and their work and so. The, you mean the, the, this direction or the mental direction? No, well, there's very few well, people well, taking the, the mental direction. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, one direction is to look at neuroscience and see how it can improve machine learning. Yeah. None of these papers are doing that here no. so far. Uh, and um, the other direction is to say, okay, machine learning is wonderful. Yeah, back propagation is wonderful. The brain must be doing some form of back prop or solving a similar problem. And how how could we have biologically plausible networks that solve the credit assignment problem yeah. with hidden layers? And yeah. that's what these papers are trying to show. Got it. Yeah, trying to, yeah. 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 Exactly. And uh, I, I went into this like I I think I call it like uh, use of dendrites in machine learning. So this is all like about trying to, uh, you know. Yeah, but they're not. None of these are used in machine learning. Well, they're, they're not used like in production or anything. But they have like they do train these on MNIST or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, they they, they do I have think... models of it, but they're not trying to. Uh, they're not trying to get the machine learning community to use these. They're looking at techniques in machine learning and trying to get the neuroscience community to appreciate it more and saying, hey, yeah. this is a way you can understand the brains more. And of course, they implement the model and they have it running in simulations. But the goal is to have biologically plausible models of backprop. Mm -hmm. that well, sense. yeah, and there is like there is an implicit goal of this is that if you can uh, is like saving things like uh, computation power, if you have like neuromorphic chips and analog, uh, you know, low power. Uh, uh, low power computation that you can do with spiking uh, spiking models, uh, and then you know spiking models have this problem with the STDP etc. Where they you know uh, it's unclear they don't perform as well. Uh, so if you can find some sort of architecture where you can where you can do this with like continuous models, mm. uh, so that, that that's partially it. But I don't think it was the main motivation here. But there are a lot of people who like, no no because I've asked them that the, the, their motivation is not to improve machine learning. It's to improve neuroscience models of how the brain learns by using machine learning as an inspiration. Sure. But there are papers that like try to justify at least the, their, um, their work as being relevant to this to uh, low power computing. Um, yeah, yeah, I have, yeah, I've seen those. And I think this could fit within that, even though it so, wasn't. So we have, this, we have the world of biologically inspired, uh, you know, uh, like, uh, like computer architectures. And now, so now we're having, uh, machine learning inspired biological architectures. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, this is a huge, this is a big part of, uh, a, the, there's tons and tons and tons of papers on that. Um, yeah, I, I know that. I just, this work here is going a little further and I hadn't, I just was curious if anything has changed. This is pretty recent work, 2017. So I just didn't know if, if, if people had started going the other direction. And I got my answer, the answer was no. Um, this is still sort of in the, the other direction. Okay. Yeah. I think the Wu et al. paper does go try to go in our direction, uh, which is trying to use biological detail to improve actual machine learning. So, hmm. yeah, yeah. That's, no, but I think some, mm -hmm. that's the paper that you're reviewing. The, the topic yeah, that's the paper that I'm going to discuss. Uh, right okay. Now. But I did. Um, I, I do find the, especially this model I find pretty interesting because it has like some interesting parallels with the um, uh, with biological data. 
And even though I, I, I'm not sure like if the neuron locally create, uh, calculates a prediction error, but you know, the fact that you have predictions uh, and I think the you're like I think Timothy Lillicrap is excited about this idea too that the feed for the feedback connections uh, are predictions basically. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that you yeah I mean it's the locally, same in back it's it's kind of the same in backcrop you can think of the error signal as a prediction a, a prediction error. Well, it is a prediction error, yeah. yeah. But uh, here you know the prediction error is calculated locally. The target isn't uh, the target projection is not explicitly prediction error but That's you know right. yeah. like uh, uh, nitpicking you know hair splitting no 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 that is the key thing is that it's not directly available and that you have to be able to do this in hidden layers uh, that and that is that is the key thing here that they're showing these local circuits can do the same thing as backprop can do which is to have good prediction error signals in hidden layers yeah so so that is the key point here Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, like whether it's yeah. implement. Yeah, okay. I, I meant implementation wise, it does. Yeah, okay. Okay, you're right. Yeah, the, the locality is basically a big part of their argument. You're right. Um, so the, the this machine learning paper that uh, I, I was thinking of is, uh, as Subutai said, sort of going in the opposite direction, tries to uh, use like this idea of having dendrites. Uh, this, is, this is from the Wu paper, you're saying? Yeah, this is the Wu paper. Okay, okay. So, but basically what it is, is just a uh, max out with uh, sparse weights. Um, so this is, the left is a diagram of a normal, uh, you know, two layer uh, neural network, fully connected weights and some kind of uh, nonlinearity here. And then their, their network basically has these uh, dendritic branches uh, and each one projects to one neuron, right? Uh, so each neuron can have any some any number of these uh, these branches, uh, and there the, the other thing they stress is that each branch in a given neuron will receive a mutually exclusive input. So there will be no overlap in the input this branch gets uh, with this branch. Different huh. branch, branches on different neurons can have overlapping input. Uh, and how do they enforce that? It's just like a programmatic. Enforcement. Yeah, it's an enforced sparsity that they also are, are really. Uh, excited about. So it's not a random, completely random sparsity. So it's not like a random mask. Uh, they, they create like an index for each, uh, for each branch, uh, for each of these like output weights here. And that's how they also propose to like minimize the, uh, the computational load of doing this. So instead of multiplying this by one big mask, that is like a number of uh, input neurons times number of branches, they have like a, a bunch of little functions basically assigning each input uh, activation to uh, a certain branch. And then they differentiate on that operation. And yeah, it, it, apparently, saves, uh, it apparently saves computational resources. Uh, not that it matters here, because this is just a neural network, um, but that, that's not a, a, a way that real neurons work. So the, uh, the, real neurons, sorry, what? Uh, real neurons, you wouldn't you wouldn't find a single cell making multiple synapses on a single branch, like a, a, a dendritic segment, a, a segment. But you do find the same axon making multiple synapses on different segments of the same branch. So this, you know, like the HTM neuron, it, it, it's not differentiated by branch; it's differentiated by segment of dendrite, which are many more segments than there are branches. Mm -hmm. um, and so the idea that I'm just pointing out, it's, 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 it's not detracting from this model at all because this model is trying to do a neural network, but I'm just pointing out for those who are interested that you wouldn't see that kind of segregation. An axon, which would be one of these colored lines from the input neurons, would actually make uh, um, often, not always, but often will make multiple synapses on different segments of the same branch. You just don't see them making multiple synapses next to each other on the same segment. It's just, but would it, just, would, mm -hmm. it's just, uh, just filling in some detail there. But would, um, would an axon make uh, connections on different segments in the same neuron? Yeah, they can, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I thought so too. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah, and on the same branch, it, the term branch refers to the major segments that attach to the soma. So yeah. a parameter neuron may have three or four branches of which each one has many segments. Um, so it's just, it, it's just a different level of parsing. And um, again, it's, it's not important for their model. It's just a, a biological detail. That's all. 
Oh yeah, of course. And I think the, they use the word branch like it's an abstraction. It's not really like. Well, yeah, they they group they group all of the they are they're taking they're going from a single point neuron to saying oh a point yeah. neuron has multiple branches. Everything that's not a soma is a branch. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 we in our HCM neuron model we said oh we have um, we have a soma uh, we have a proximal input, and then we have multiple segments. Each segment is like an independent uh, little uh, coincidence detector. Our model is not complete either because we don't, the HTM neuron model doesn't um, try to make any distinction about the uh, dynamics of a, of a neuro, a dendritic branch in terms of all the different places the branch splits. So when, the, when the neuron uh, a dendrite branch splits, there's kind of complicated dynamics occur at those intersections. That, so it's mm -hmm. not like our model is complete either, but it was just different levels of abstraction. Oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, this model uses yeah. backprop, so it's it's a completely no, no. Yeah, I, it just um, it just it, it, I don't know if it's useful to me. But I'm saying these things just because it helps me to keep in mind what the differences are here. No, it definitely is useful. Um, yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah, definitely, this is not yeah. like a okay trying to. I mean, yeah. they're trying to like make it. They motivate it as trying to make it like closer to the complexity of real neurons, but in reality, it is. And it's getting closer, so it's good. But yeah. it's there's just I'm just pointing out the differences. Yeah. 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 At the model level, if you have the same axon uh, with several connections to the same branch, can't you just interpret that as having a higher weight in that? No, because, because the, the integration zone on a dendrite is not the branch, it's the segment. It's a, in the HTM neuron and in the, in the, in the uh, de, uh, our neuron paper, and the, the, the neuroscience says that the, the inputs to a dendrite are, are combined over a fairly short distance, like typically they say 40 microns, so 40 thousandths of an inch. And you might have, you can have up to let's say 40 synapses in that distance. So there may be, there may be dozens of brand, uh, segments and thousands of synapses, but the integration zone, what would be the equivalent of like a little neuron is only a small section of a branch it's, um, or a segment. So if you, if you have a synapse if you imagine you have this, this one a, a dendritic branch and this, it forks out like a tree and there's, there's hundreds or thousands of synapses all over them. If you, ran, if you just activate several of those synapses on there, they don't sum at all. They just, they just but only, they only sum if you activate several synapses right next to each other in very close proximity on the same segment. Then they sum, but otherwise they don't sum at all. They just, it's just like they're, it's like they're, they're totally in non-communication. Right, but what what they're calling branch in this model would be equivalent to a segment, then. Right? I don't but, think so. I, I well, uh, I guess you could maybe they call it that. Maybe maybe that's one way to look at. It. And then then they're saying, okay, these neurons have two segments, which is very limited. Um, I I sort of interpreted it meant they really meant a branch, but maybe I guess you could look at it that way. You could say, um, if for example, uh, yeah, you could look at it that way. I guess. Uh, I don't know how many actual neurons here, but a real segment on a real neuron, again, could, could sort of maxes out at 40 synapses that could be summed together. And here you might have, I don't know, how many of these, how many input neurons you have here? Um, Arbitrary. How many? A lot? Uh, I don't know the neurons. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they have I, like different sparsity parameters that they- I, I, imagine, I imagine there's hundreds, if not thousands, right? I don't know. I, what do these, neur these networks look like? Yeah, I mean, this, their models are pretty small, but they, they, they're trying to make a proof of concept, but they, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I think we've beaten this up enough. I think we should keep going. Unless, unless someone's had a burning question. I, I have one question. So uh, you, you mentioned that the, um, if you look at uh, uh, where the branches diverge, what, what you're calling branches diverge, that the, um, that the uh, the model of how those interact is is complicated. Do is there a simplifying way of looking at that? I understand the the, uh, the segments represent you know, individual compartments, but when they converge on actually the the, uh, the, I, when the I, branches I, converge, do we know what happens? No. Well, there's a lot of physiological data on it, um, but it's really complex, and I don't think there's any consensus. Okay. So, uh, well. Seems, you know, well, seems like it's important. <laughs> well, well, I think if most of the research on this would be the following. They, they would, let's say you imagine you have a single branch looks like a Y, right? So you have, mm -hmm. the, you have two segments coming on to another segment. And 
what they show is that if you if you activate um, a synapse on one segment and active a synapse on another segment, there's a little bit of depolarization. And what you find is that the, that depolarization doesn't doesn't slide through the junction. The junction is um, it, it, it's a different impedance match, if you will, a different impedance function for the junction. And so if you try to match a, like a voltage gradient going through the junction, it gets lost. It doesn't work like it. Up into the junction, you can model it as this like leaky pipe. But once you get to the junction, all kinds of crap happens. So you see a lot of models about that. However, our belief, well, our model, in, and there's evidence to this, is that if, once you have a dendritic um, uh, spike, like an NMDA spike, it is able to travel through the junction. Um, it doesn't get highly transformed. So uh, if, you're, if you're imagining inputs from different, brand, different segments are getting combined downstream after going through these junctions, it doesn't look like that's easy or it happens or it's just weird. But if you assume that there's a dendritic spike traveling down a dendritic um, um, branch or segment, then they seem to be able to get through the, the Y junction and they keep going. So, so in that model, the Y junctions are just simply connectivity. They don't have any... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the way we model it. And my, my point is that some neuroscientists would disagree with that because if you study how the complex dynamics of those Y junctions and they say, well, it's really complex because we did all these studies. And, but the idea that, that it's not nearly as complex if you assume a dendritic branch. So, uh, I mean, assuming a dendritic spike. So we model it as if they're non-existent. There's other, there's other evidence that suggests there are some things going on there. For example, there seems to be some evidence that even dendritic spikes, it matters uh, how far out they are on the tree of the branching. And, and if, you're gonna, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna activate multiple dendritic segments, the order in which you activate them it can make a difference. So there's some, there's some evidence that if I start at the very end, and activate a dendritic spike, and then I activate another dendritic spike partly along the way, and another one that the, the whole signal propagates better than if you if then so like there's an order of preference than if you do it backwards. We don't model that. We haven't tried to accommodate that at all. So so one would think that if you have the dendritic spike traveling down, there's a depolarization that occurs that another one that might occur a little bit afterwards, further on up on the Y, might have more difficulty uh, propagating down because you know. Things are Maybe, or it's, uh, yeah, it's really complicated. I think we'd have to go back and look at this. Um, okay, all right. Yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Right, uh, thanks for that, Joe. Uh, right, so realistically or not, this is their, uh, their model. And this, uh, like I said, it's basically uh, the operation the dendrites are doing is a uh, max out. So max out is uh, basically the fact that you, every neuron, the, instead of having some kind of deterministic nonlinear activation function, such as a sigmoid or a relu or whatever, they take the, they have a number of branches that come in and they each, you know, have like different, different input uh, and they select the one that has the, the highest. So what this, so this is like, called like a learned activation function. And uh, there's people here who are a lot more uh, expert at, uh, max out another like learned activation function. So uh, please correct me if I say something wrong. Uh, what it can do is learn piecewise linear functions. Um, and like, depending on the number of, uh, you know, let's quote unquote branches you get per, uh, per output unit, uh, it can become like an increasingly complex uh, piecewise linear function. So this, so this is a generalization of the rectified linear unit uh, to several other like piecewise linear functions. So the rectifier is, just this, it's the max of, uh, you know, the max of X uh, or, or zero, right? So if it's smaller than zero, then you return zero. Uh, but it, you know, if it ends up doing something like the absolute value, you can get like, uh, for negative X, you can get like uh, this guy here, right? And so like, this would be one branch and this would be another branch. Uh, and having multiple branches could give you something like a quadratic function. Uh, is this more or less correct? Well, yeah, uh, what's the difference between this and uh, K winner with K equals one. Um, the, the, the difference is that K winner is uh, strictly positive. No, no, that's not true. Uh, K winner. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Right. yeah. I think, I think the difference here is that if I understand correctly in max out, um, all the act, all the activation values are the same. Is that right? Since you're applying to the max to each, um, 
to each activation. What do you mean all the activation values are the same? Um, hey, what are you taking the max over here? So it takes the max uh, of each one of these branch units. So the neuron is just like a pass through of the maximum of its branch. Just yeah, k equals one, basically winner uh, of the branch. Yeah, I mean they don't have boosting or anything here, but um, if you ignore boosting, it this seems to be uh, almost identical. I mean, there's differences in how they've set up the connections, which you have explained before. Right. But other than that, um, it seems like it's the same as k winner with k equals one. Right, that's true. Yeah, here the, the difference is that each one of, with k winners, like in the max pooling layer, uh, we have is that these there's sparse weights from uh, whatever these are to the neurons, uh, and then these uh, the top k of these get go through with k equals one. Here they have like full connectivity from the branches to the neurons, but there's sparse weight to the branches. So that's like a little bit of a like a structural difference that would influence what the um, yeah, so I, I can't see any difference as well, just to add. Uh, usually max out is used with uh, local regions. So it would be the equivalent to K winners equals one, but local K winners. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. That would be max out. I mean, as far as my understanding goes, it might be wrong. Yeah, but in this, in this simple like, linear case, there is no real difference, right? Uh, yeah. Um, so, and they partially motivate the idea of having the sparsity, uh, which they stress is different than other types of sparsity that they tried uh, up to the point, uh, is mo uh, motivated by the idea of the model ensembling, where if you combine like random features or random components of a model, or something like dropout, basically, uh, you get better performance and hopefully better generalization. Um, but though, uh, though this is similar to dropout, they, in their experiments, they do not compare this to a max out activation with dropout. Um, and max out was designed to be compatible with, with dropout, basically, as a motivation. Uh, so performance-wise, in the paper itself, they only showed training loss um, and not, not test loss. You, uh, test loss was only in the, in the supplements. Uh, but they basically made these graphs where uh, they, they showed the number of branches per neuron, you know, for a given network size and given layer size. And they combined uh, their model, the dendritic neural network, with uh, this is like layer normalization uh, with and ReLU or batch normalization in ReLU. And this is the training loss, basically. So like bas effectively, like how, how quickly does the training loss drop? Uh, and they find like there's a sweet spot uh, for this task at least, and this is on the fashion and this, and they did a few different experiments. They did it on the CPAR 10, CPAR 100, and then the UCI um, data set at the end. And they find like a sweet spot of number of branches, right? If there's too few, it's comparable to uh, max out if, uh, or, you know, layer normalization. If there's too many, it's also the same. And in between, it basically trains faster. I don't know, just really basic. What does training loss mean? Uh, it means the, the loss like between the output and the target. Um, in mean, whatever is, you it, it, is, is, it, uh, is it just the accuracy of the network? Uh, why is it called training loss? Yeah, so they could have plotted the accuracy here. Um, the, the loss is basically, you know, here this would be, uh, these, this is categorical. So this would be like a categorical cross entropy. So that's between the, you know, the binary uh, vector of outputs and the binary vector of uh, targets. But why is it called training? So when you plot accuracy, you're kind of thresholding and you're saying like, what was that? What you're, you're saying the network had one guess it, cla it classified it as this one thing. Uh, training loss captures confidence in it. If it was really confident in the right thing, it gets a lower loss. Uh, if it, if, if, if it gets something wrong, but it assigned 50% probability to the correct answer, then it doesn't get penalized right. as, I get as that. largely. Thank you. I get that. Yes. Why is it called training loss then? Why isn't it just called like, um, I don't know, weighted loss or, you know, scale? I don't know. Uh, I think, it? It's just a, yeah, go ahead, Lucas. I think what Jeff's asking is that there is a difference between training and what we call validation or test loss. 
And training just means you're, it's the loss on the same data set you're training your model in. Oh, 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 I see, I see. While, oh, while, while you're doing validation or test loss, that means you train on a different data set and then you validate. All right, that's very simple, thank you. Yeah, so okay. validation loss means regularization, it means, sorry, generalization. Yeah, all right, all right. It's basically loss on the training set. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. That was, the, uh, maybe I right also understood. I just didn't know that. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Um, that was a uh, simple explanation I wanted. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, and this is uh, exactly this. So as, they, as they're training, they plot the loss for each epoch, and they find that basically it goes down faster at some point with their, uh, with their model with 16 branches per neuron, for example. It is really weird not to show the validation loss. Yeah, it is weird. Uh, they do show it in the supplements, uh, and this was a little bit fishy too, because- You could expect like overfitting you know, when it gets, when training loss, loss gets too low. Right, yeah, there's uh, that, uh, absolutely. That's what they want to show, no? That they can overfit, that their model is, uh, has enough capacity and it learns, so it overfits. <laughs> that's all they want to show. Maybe. <laughs> um, and they compare, so they, they, they have like a, they compare two versions of their model. One is the standard one with max out, and the other one is with the same, you know, uh, sparse weights, but instead of a max out, they have a relu and average pooling afterward. Um, and what, and you know, these, these lines here are the, uh, you know, the, the test accuracy of their, uh, this is again on fashion MNIST, uh, the test accuracy of their model based on branches per neuron, right? And these little guys here are different uh, models. These are like uh, layer normalization or batch normalization. Uh, and one thing you'll find interesting is that these are on the same task, these different networks trained on the same task, but these dots are different <laughs> in both, uh, in both uh, plots. So I, I'm not sure what like the comparison is supposed to be here. Uh, Cause I, if I was making this plot, I would have these constant and just show the different, um, the different activations here uh, alongside them for reference. Wait, well, so, what do you mean? I didn't quite understand what you said. So, look, so here, for example, this, is, this little uh, hexagon is the, the performance of batch norm relu with 512 units in the hidden layer, yeah. right? And it's on the same task, right? Test accuracy. Over here, it, <laughs> when they use max out on their model, it's over here. <laughs> uh, but wait, what do you mean it's over there? So it's at a different position relative to Batch normal is 256. It's the same, it's the same icon though, I'm missing it. Exactly, so it's the same network trained on the same data set, but it has a different test accuracy. Uh, so that is but what- the, But the titles, but these, the titles of these two graphs are different, so there must be some differences between the two. Yeah, they're using a different function for the neuron. One's a max out and one is a, a ray low plus. Yeah, but that's for the, 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 uh, the uh, double N model. Not for the other models. Oh, so the other models, they should, they should be identical. You they should be identical, as far as I understand. So uh, reading well, the they, they clearly aren't, so there must be something else going on. <laughs> so what I imagine they did is this is like a, di a different training run. Um, mm, or different they're, they're, fun they're fundamentally yeah. differently shaped uh, all around. They're all seeming, in the up one, they seem to go up and down. Here, they sort of go down and up. I mean. Um, oh yeah, yeah, but this is for their model, right? Uh, what I was pointing out was the, the no, comparison. the other ones. The other ones. It, it oh. seems hard to believe that the other ones are different just by random seed. But Aries, why, why um, do you think they didn't plot the whole curve for this? And rather, they held the number of branches fixed for the ones. For, yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Sorry if this wasn't clear. The uh, the other models, the models they're comparing to, do not have a concept of dendrite branches. They're but, standard. But they, they must because they're showing the. They're showing the curves change over the, over the axis labeled branches per neuron. Yeah, yeah. This is for their model, so they have. They no, have no. But animation. you're saying you're saying that the red line, which is not their model, which is uh, no, that is their model. You're saying like, uh, like diamond. Oh, 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 I see. I see. Those other icons are not being plotted. They're just saying this is what the fixed value is over the all yeah, this. And you're, exactly. and you're pointing out that the order in which those dots appear is different. I got yes. it. Yes. Yeah. I it's it's, it's a little weird. So that, is, yeah. that, different, that difference you're saying could be just the fact that there was a, 
um, random seed yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah it's also but the it, fact that the it, y-axis are slightly different too so if you're trying to visually <laughs> do a b that's are the y-axis different yeah it's 0.86 here and 0.87 here oh oh, oh there's okay. that slightly different got it okay i'm sorry i didn't understand this chart yet but, yeah but their ordering is also different it's not just the relative spacing right yeah um, yeah yeah um so it, it's a little bit strange um but yeah so the, the these neuro, these models these the diamond and triangle models they do not have a concept of branches per neuron they're normal fully connected models uh with one hidden layer and the the number here is the number of units uh, in the hidden layer so earlier you said that it was, uh, was it 16 and, and 64 dendrite branches? But here they're, on, they're, here they're starting at 64. Um, so they're starting at a higher number, is that correct? Like the, the black line is D-E-N-N 64. I assume that means, no, that's not branches per neuron. The branches per neuron is plotted down below. Never mind, I got it. Yeah. Take it back. This is the hidden, this is also the hidden layer. Yeah, I got it, right. So the branches per neuron is down below and 16 is like a sweet spot for them. Yeah. Exactly. And the hidden layer is the one that has the, the, the branches here, the input and output yeah, layer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, that's cool. Um, oh, is, is, yeah. Is, are they showing there that max out only works with a small number of branches per neuron? And then if you go to a larger number, you have to use average pooling? Is that it? Is that what these two plots are showing? So if you go too far, you have average pooling. Yeah, because max out only works with small numbers of branches and then it goes down as you increase the number of branches. But average pooling goes up as you increase the number of branches, right? Yeah, actually, I, I hadn't heard of average pooling until, uh, until the reading this paper, so I'm not exactly sure how it works. Um, well, average pooling is just taking the average of all the, like, you get okay. a put of 64 branches, you just average them. Right, That's instead all. of, like, max pooling where you take the highest one or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So they find this trend that you know increases with the number of branches per neuron. So max out, yeah. So relative plus average pooling increases with the number of branches per neuron. Basically, I guess you're just adding more parameters. Uh, and there's a sweet spot for the uh, branches per neuron uh, in in their model, and with a max out with the sparse incoming weights. Well, I'm not sure. This looks more like a decrease here, but the you know in the training uh, loss, they looks more like a sweet spot. But I don't know. I mean, well, that was the point it was made earlier that the training loss is not really the good indicator, right? But I guess, like Marcus said, there it does have it does indicate something, right? Um, it's not like uh, the performance of it's not really the performance of your network, but it's something about you know the confidence of the predictions or how it yeah. works. Uh, the, the that, that's just where I was talking about loss versus accuracy, but training versus test loss is a different conversation. Yeah. Anyway, according to this, if I interpret this correctly. That these, uh, these these this model only really does better than existing models under the scenario of like 64 segments under those two those two lines on the bottom the dotted blue and the dotted green those are the only two that sort of perform capably is that is that the correct uh, interpretation right yeah so the not yeah. not on the top one on the bottom the bottom oh. one with the average pooling right the best oh. Uh, well, the green and the blue one are the best ones all around in, in both charts. Yeah, highest, biggest hidden layer, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they find that, you know, depending on the branches per neuron, that, you know, how, how it approximates the performance of these other networks that don't have the, the okay. dendrite. Yeah. Okay. So they're, they don't get better, uh, better test accuracy or anything like that in any of their, um, in any of the results. But the, the title is Improved Expressivity. So uh, that was something that I needed to spend a little time uh, or expressiveness uh, looking up. So basically what a, a neural network does is this, right? So let's say you have like a non-separable non region, like the XOR problem or these two overlapping, um, sorry, I just need to wait for it to go through. You know, this thing is not literally separable. What a hidden, uh, what a hidden layer does is it twists the space of the problem such that the, these become linear, linearly separable, right? Uh, and this, the, yeah, this post on Chris Ola's book is really cool. Uh, and there's, there was a paper uh, in 2017 uh, that sort of tried to quantify uh, the, the number of, you know, distorting lines that a hidden layer creates or like a network creates uh, 
as as a form of expressiveness or uh, the number of configurations that are like a or the computational complexity of uh, of the computational complexity, the complexity of the operations that the um, so the word expressiveness that means how many uh, that how much you can stretch the space to make these linearly separable is that what the word expressiveness means? Well, oh, how many how many different stretches you can make? Okay, I think okay. is the idea. Um, okay, but basically how many of these lines you can create? So if you have like a, in the input layer, let's say you have a, one, two, three, four, um, four units. When you train it, these are the lines through the space, if it's a 2D space like in this, in this image, uh, these are the lines that it can separate through, right? So this is like, it could separate, this one separates, you know, this and that, as this one separates this and that. Um, if you add a layer on top of that, basically you create a new bunch of lines, but it's the, this, bunch of, uh, this bunch of lines times the number of units in the previous layer. So for every unit that's active in the previous layer, it will drive a different Com permutation of these lines in the next layer. Uh, so, so each so this doubles quote un, the quote unquote expressiveness uh, of the of the network because you can have for you know you can, you have a much higher space of separation, right? So for 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 this guy's activation, you let's say one neuron can do this piece this piecewise linear uh, separation. Uh, and for, diff for this activation, let's say it's the same neuron, uh, does this one. You know. Actually, maybe the, the, yeah, maybe the neurons here are each, um, uh, it's like the shade of green is supposed to indicate a different neuron, I don't know. And then so if you I, add a layer, mm -hmm. Well, it looks to me like what you're saying, you, you, when you go from the layer zero to layer one, you're keeping the first set of neurons, the black ones, and now the green ones are basically are dividing up the individual from black line to black line. So the, 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 that's the, you're sort of subdividing each. Yeah, each you're, you're more finally partitioning the space. Yeah, yeah, but you're still keeping the first partitions, right? And then now, and now- Yeah, we you still have that, yeah. Yeah, so now when you have the purple lines, you still got the green and the black partitions, but now you're subdividing those still. Exactly. So the idea is that, like, yeah, uh, the layer two will only be like these purple lines, but they. I've never, I've never, I've never seen this picture before like this. Like, is this a commonly understood uh, description of what's going on? Uh, I think this component of it is. This is like pretty basic. Uh, that I've, I've that, that I've seen before, but I never yeah. saw it, it, it shown in a in a simple two D projection like this. Well, that, that's kind of how support vector machines kind of look. Yeah. Uh, look. So that's. This is just yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, it's uh, funny. I yeah, I get that, but I never understood that it was um, a, pr a, a sort of I, I would support vector machines. I said, oh, you got all these divisions, right? Um, but I always thought they were. I thought it'd be more like you. The green, the black lines went all across the figure, then the green lines would go all across the figure, and the purple lines go all across the figure. But they're not. They're only each successive one is is only going and drawing a line between one of the previous segments. Um, well, I, I, I think, the, I mean, this is a projection, but I think the reality is, is that you, you, you keep partitioning in higher and higher spaces. So these are actually volumes. This is just a representation. Yes, I, I understand that. But I, I guess I didn't understand there was a progression like this. I always thought support vector machines were just saying, oh, we just, we just divide up the space into a lot of, you know, planes, essentially. And, uh, and then you got a bunch of components. But this is sort of saying, as you're saying, this is a progression. You're, 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 it's a hierarchy of divisions going on here, in some sense. Right. Well, yeah, a lot of no. support vector machines only have just one layer, just you know, very yeah. finely subdivided. This is okay. Yeah. If you cascade them, you're going to get yeah. this effect. Yeah. I just didn't. I never saw this before. It's interesting. The deep support vector machine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. What, what one question I had on the previous slide with the 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 numbers that were appended on each of those things was that the width of the of the layer. Uh, you mean each one of these here? Yeah, is, is that the width of the of the layer or is that somehow related to some kind of depth? That, no, that is the width. That's the number of units of the hidden layer. Okay, so basically what they're saying is the reason why we're winning uh, with the higher, uh, the, I mean, well, that's one of the things we found in sparsity is that if we have greater width, we have, if you wish, more expressive power. So you, the notion of when you create those, uh, you had that representation of where uh, you know you can model various functions and then you can get you know piecewise linear 
basically is saying that with the more with the greater width you can have more and more complex if you wish separation planes in some sense but yeah that it's that has more ability to uh in the in the next slide where you're showing all those stretches basically it means that you can kind of thread the thing in between those distributions better is that kind of fair uh yeah as far as i understand um but the measure of complexity doesn't yeah the measure of complexity here and this paper has like a number of different measures uh, but one of them is basically uh this let's say you, per, you train the network um and you you present an input so you go uh you go through a trajectory and one of the there, one of the measures is the number of piecewise, the number of linear, um, uh, how do you call it, uh, transitions, the number of linear transitions uh, per trajectory um, uh, is, a, is a measure of, expressive, of expressiveness. So here you have like every time when you switch, you know, in the input space, you're going to affect, you know, the, these, these activations here, and that will lead to uh, different activations here and then the purple ones. So you're gonna have more linear transitions. So for example, here, if you, this is your trajectory, let's say you start here and you just go around, right? So every, at every T you present like the different part of this input. Uh, this is a trajectory that's curved out by the activations of the, um, uh, of the subsequent layers. So let's say this is layer one, layer two, layer three. And you find that with more layers, you get a uh, higher, you know, more complex uh, trajectories that are traced out because they have more linear transitions between. Um, and yeah, so that's what they call expressiveness. Um, and they find that the, uh, the width isn't actually the, a very big contributor to this. Uh, after some point, there might be a little bit of a trend in the beginning, but what seems uh, to be much more of a much more uh, predictive of it is the network depth. So assuming the assuming you know nonlinear units in each layer, um, the network depth uh, is like very you know strongly predicts the the number of transitions. So quote unquote model expressiveness. So by this regard, this paper uh, outperforms you know uh, equivalent max out or a standard ReLU uh, network. Uh, by counting, you know, having these transition counts per, with a given trajectory. Now, so I, I don't exactly know what the trajectory is. They showed how they did it, like as in, you know, like you have a A plus delta, you know, and they, they point out the theorem uh, and they prove, well, they, they demonstrate that, you know, this, their, their architecture is also a universal uh, approximator, like a standard, uh, you know, uh, one hidden layer network. Uh, but they, the transition counts for the same trajectory are higher in their network uh, than the max out um, network with the same number uh, of units in the hidden layer uh, end of a ReLU uh, network. Now, the thing that they didn't do, as I mentioned before, is compare this uh, with uh, a max out that also had dropout. So in the other networks, they did add like batch normalization and other tricks that would improve the accuracy of the networks, uh, but they did not drop out. Um, so, so, so for the ReLU networks, how do they do branches per neuron? What does that mean? Oh, sorry. The, um, yeah, if you look at the green. Sorry. Yeah. So these networks, yeah. So sorry. So this is with the this is with the dendrites, but with uh, with their uh, active. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But I thought their DENN had max out. So it is maxed out. I think the difference is the the weight sparsity. So what they're calling max out there has no weight sparsity. Uh, yeah. Let me double check. It's like every dendrite has a full connectivity to the previous. Baseline, so baseline ReLU full, uh, full neural, I think F and N stands for like fully connected neural network. Uh, mm -hmm. For the max out network, yeah, they, so for so the dense, they, they have like a different branch number. For the max out network, they increase the number of kernels in the max out unit. Okay, yeah, that's the difference, there's the sparsity. So it's like a fully connected layer with max out. 
Uh, and then for the ReLU, da, da, da. yeah, actually, I'm not clear about this. Uh, they don't really mention what the, hmm. what happened. So I was curious about this too. I think it's supposed, I would think it would be straight, but it's not. Unless this is an illusion that it's going down by the fact that there's curves going upwards. Right, right. Is it actually, it actually I think it's actually straight. Yeah, so I think this is supposed to be like a set value and they're, they're just, it's a visual aid for comparison. Um, mm, okay. Sorry, does it look uh, down, does this green line look like it goes downwards to you guys? It's hard to tell. It doesn't look perfectly horizontal for sure. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but maybe it is. It's hard to yeah, tell. I think, yeah, I think it might be an illusion. That's kind of cool. Right, so that's basically the, the main driving point of the paper is that, oh, look, we have this like higher number of linear transitions uh, per trajectory. So this model is more expressive than standard max out. But as I said, again, they don't compare it with dropout um, and they don't compare it with other types of sparsity either. Um, and by types of sparsity, I mean like how they implement it, you know, mutually exclusive uh, per dendrite. And they claim that they reduce the computational cost in memory um, by having just an index uh, an index for yeah, I can I can definitely see that that way it's identical to a normal yeah without dendrites yeah. so yeah in conclusion you know I, this, I presented a couple of different ways of using quote unquote dendrites in your uh, machine learning models uh, and you know some of the ideas are to separate the feedback slash error pathways uh, and that's one thing you can leverage uh, using dendrites uh, or you know you increase the capacity and expressiveness and um, there have been some papers mainly by, you know, Bordazzi and Mel and Bordazzi's lab that, uh, you know, having a number of nonlinear uh, dendrite segments increases, uh, um, uh, increases the, the memory capacity of, uh, of, a, of each unit. So, uh, yeah, with this, uh, that, that's the end of my, uh, my spiel. If you guys have any, you know, questions or comments. All right. I have a question. Sure. Uh, how does this model compares to the one you showed us uh, last week and before the one you're working on, have you uh, give some, gave some thought about this? Oh, with the, uh, yeah, so that I'm still debugging. So it learns stuff, but. Um, I, I don't, I'm not asking the results. I mean, just how they're. Oh, like uh, qualitative, like the structurally. Yeah. Yeah. So the model, one of the models I'm working on has a, like a similar concept, it's feed forward and has a number of dendritic segments per, per unit. And there's also sparse weights coming into it. So uh, the motivation for this was increased capacity. Uh, I wanted each, you know, uh, for each branch uh, to uh, having different branches uh, leading to the neuron being able to respond differently uh, to completely different inputs. So this would be, for example, this would be for continual learning where, you know, you'd have different tasks. So let's say here, you know, every branch uh, would correspond to like a task roughly, right? Um, and then uh, one thing I wanted to do on top of that is use a, a type of feedback. So this would be, you know, feedback from the output here, but in, in reality, it's just another feed forward layer where, where, which uh, with the input number being like the number of, number of classes or, you know, you can design it however you like um, that has, Where's the annotation thing? There we go. Um, else. Does this look like anything now? Why is it? Oh, draw, sorry. Right, so the idea is to have like a little, like this, sorry for the bad annotation, a little feed forward uh, layer that uh, creates with the with, uh, sparse projections to uh, each branch, right? You know, uh, et cetera, you can imagine. And the idea being that there'd be some kind of gating or some type of coincidence detection uh, such that, you know, when some feed forward component or feature um, is uh, co-occurs with uh, the relative, the, the categorical input. So let's say, if this isn't clear to people, let's say you're training on, uh, uh, on task one, and this is like the task one categorical neuron. So 
task one projects to here and here, right? So when this input comes in uh, to you know, this, these dendritic segments uh, and it co-occurs with uh, this categorical input that you, on, that you, only drive, uh, you only drive weight update or learning then. Uh, and the idea is that because of sparsity, you would not, uh, you would get for each one of these tasks, you wouldn't get, uh, you would get minimal overlap between, um, between the, the dendritic segments that they project to. Uh, so that you would hopefully have a different population of uh, dendrite segments per task. Um, that's the idea. Does right. that answer your question, Lucas? Yeah, so, so it's the same basic core, but then you add this extra categorical input that's gonna drive uh, the learning to be specialized for each branch, you could say right. that. And the other thing is, uh, I mean, right now I'm trying to work out first. Uh, I mean, I have uh, played with adding the categorical input. It doesn't, it makes things worse, but that's because I haven't like, you know, optimized anything. Um, the, um, oh, that was, that was inaccurate. Uh, what I, um, excuse me. What I'm doing now, I haven't, I don't necessarily use max out. I have set up something equivalent to max out, which is a K equals one K winners um, for, for, each, uh, for each branch per, per unit. Uh, but I, I haven't settled on an activation function for this, but it needs to be some kind of nonlinearity, right? Um, and then I want to see like if just having these uh, branches increases the capacity of the network uh, in some meaningful way. And I think one big diff another difference that you kind of mentioned this is that the way the sparsity is done yeah, is very different. Uh, here, there each dendrite is mutually exclusive inputs to every other dendrite on that same neuron. Whereas yeah. in our case, we want a distributed encoding, so we don't yeah. have that restriction. Exactly. So there will and be. I some think that makes a big difference in yeah. in both ways because you have double X that's coming from the input and double Y that's coming from the cat categorical input, like the task embedding. So. I what you're saying is you have free distributed weights in both double X and double Y or double task in that case. Is that it? Yeah. Well, Pretty definitely in the input. In the categorical, if it's one hot encoding, then uh, it wouldn't matter. But if it's a distributed encoding, yeah, then, then we'd want a distributed sparse encoding in both cases. But here, even for the input, the inputs are mutually exclusive per branch which is kind of a weird, they're all doing it only because of computational efficiency. There's no algorithmic reason to do it, I think, that way. Yeah, that's what I was understand. I think there is a biological reason in the paper that, you know, an axon is only gonna connect. You only have, so each neuron, each neuron is only gonna connect to another neuron one, so you could, couldn't connect to two branches. So I think, yeah, I think what they say is that one axon from one year is not gonna connect to two branches for the same neuron, the uh, same output neuron. And, and they right. have, but depending on what you call a branch that might, may or may not be true, but uh, yeah. But yeah, I think that was like an idea they had for kind of abstraction. So Aries, um, wait, is, did, uh, Lucas, are you still, uh, are you done with your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Great. So, Aries, um, where is the the small sigma? Is that where the max out is applied? Yeah, yeah. They use the big sigma as just a summation. Um, okay, so that means that it's basically, uh, in in more of a machine learning sense, it's like taking different transformations of the data and and then just picking the one which has the highest activation value, right? Yeah, it takes the it takes the max of the vector of like branches. branches. And then what's and so I still I'm still not clear. What's the intuition behind doing that in this architecture? Uh, I think the idea is that they just like max out. <laughs> I um, because it has this uh, you know this cool property. And in, in their introduction, they mentioned how like a lot of the recent success of you know, a lot of the improvement of deep learning in the past few years has been due to learn, learnable activation functions such as MaxOut. So they wanted to use one of those. Uh, as far as I understand- Yeah, I'm that, not sure what they mean by learnable activation function. The, the activation function seems fixed. The only thing that's learned are these weights. Well, the, uh, yeah, it, it, the, mm -hmm. it works like our K-winners, right? Like, yeah, yeah, it's like our K-winners. It's like we are learning, it's like ReLU, but we're learning the threshold. So MaxOut, it's kind of the same thing. So that's, I think, 
what I think they mean by learning, we're learning that threshold. Mm, okay, but that threshold is not a fixed threshold. It's dependent on the inputs. Yeah, so it, it, right, yeah. Yeah, it's dependent on the inputs, but it's also sort of learn, right? You learn what both. <laughs> it's dependent and it's learned as well. Yeah, yeah, maybe we're splitting hairs. Yeah, it, it's definitely learning the weights, which has an impact. Um, and uh, but the, the max, fun the activation function is fixed. Right, like, like, like when we have a sigmoid uh, right, with right. a bias function, no one says we're learning an activation function, even though right. the sigmoid, the bias is actually moving the zero point back and forth. Right, um, that's, that's still a, a fixed point. function. Right. There are also learnable activation functions, that the activation functions which, which actually have parameters. And yeah, parameters yeah, exactly. Yeah. This is not that. Yeah. What I understood from the learnable thing is that uh, you, by you know changing the weights, you can learn like a different function here. Uh, like you could, this could be imagine you, this could like be morphed into something like a sigmoid or some kind of you know up and down thing. But the way that's it's true for ReLU too. That's uh, that's true for a combination of ReLUs, but with max out you have bit, yeah. But I need to think about this. I'm not sure if I understand that true for ReLU bit. Um, but with, okay, but the the rel is just this, right? A single one, yeah. But if you had this architecture where you replace max with ReLU everywhere, as you increase the number of branches, you would learn different. Uh, you could learn these different quadratic functions. Oh, you mean that the uh, ReLU, the positive region would only uh, happen when there's some, you know, some interesting, some kind of function and the uh, ReLU is projecting to it. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, it would be, a, it would be a two layer network, basically, yeah. which can yeah. learn any function. <laughs> so, so I think a, a point here, part of this is just language and how we're choosing to talk about it. But like the point is these neurons here, these little neuro sigma neurons here can learn complicated like uh, uh, shapes in the input space, whereas a normal neuron is always just like a, a hyperplane or it's always just like a, po a point in some direction and a threshold. But the, here the threshold is kind of curvy like these because they have these multiple branches. And that's, the, so this that's is, right. I think, yeah. is where they're coming from. So, but yeah, I think yeah. it's really just I agree with that. thing of language. We, we're just, okay. we're, we're choosing to call the, the, the nonlinearity. Suddenly it seems like a silly characterization, but if you think of the whole system as a whole, as, it, as the neuron as a whole, the function the neuron is learning, I think that's where they're coming from. Exactly, yeah, yeah. I totally agree with that. Uh, absolutely, the, the neuron itself is more complex uh, this way. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. I was, I was just confused about what people meant over there. Cool. Just to go back to current question, I, uh, I also believe, uh, I'm not sure, I, I read this paper like two weeks ago, but I also think they have a biological motivation for the max out, that you only need one brain too far for the neuron too far. So you, don't, you don't need more than one. So I think the max out there, it's also biologically motivated. Yeah, but that's not true actually. That, that goes back to what Jeff was saying earlier. A single branch activating is usually not enough to make a neuron fire. Oh, okay. um, even though that's how the original Poirazi and Mel, they modeled it that way, but that's not actually physiologically true. Right. An NMDA spike or a dendritic spike is not sufficient to, a single one is not sufficient to make the neuron fire. That's, that's the, the genesis of the prediction in the neuron. Yeah. Theory. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't uh, remember where the, the bit you mentioned is, Lucas, about the, this motivation. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I might be wrong. I might be also. Uh, no, no, I think that is that is how Poirazi and Mel originally modeled it that way. And this guy, um, I think that one of the authors was a collaborator with Bartlett Mel um, a while ago. So I wouldn't be surprised if they had that same kind of assumption built in here. It says Parise and Mel there somewhere in that text. <laughs> you just yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, there was an interesting uh, structural learning rule paper uh, that I'm sure a lot of you have seen. Um, the, the motivation for it was a uh, neuromorphic computing. Where's the Firefox thing? Is it here?
sorry. Uh, I mean, we, we could stop recording if you, you guys, you know, it's, this is uh, irrelevant. But let me find this paper. Oh, yeah. So, sorry, how do you delete annotations? <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like having it floating around myself. It's kind of fun. <laughs> well, let me, uh, let me just do this. Oops. There's a clear button with the annotations if you go back to annotations. No, I'm just going to do like it. A... Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, the, um, yeah, so um, I didn't have the time to read a lot through this paper, but they basically do a, a morphological, quote unquote, morphological learning rule, which is similar uh, in spirit to HTM, you know, like given a certain condition, do you increment or decrement, uh, or in this case, they, they create or subtract new binary synapses. Um, so I, I thought that was kind of cool. Um, anyway, any other questions? Hey, could you put it back up again? I was trying to screen capture the title and oh, then I'm sorry. annotated the hell out of it. So <laughs> I can send it over Slack too. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Uh, we'll give us 18 minutes till lunch. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Aris. It was interesting. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.